Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. After flattening the curve of COVID-19 cases in Australia, states and territories have begun easing restrictions. Guiding decisions on easing restrictions is the Roadmap to Recovery report, produced by more than 100 researchers. The two strategies that have been presented include elimination and controlled adaptation. Here to explain some of the details is Australian Academy of Science Fellow and past President of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, Professor Ian Fraser. Ian, welcome. Welcome, Paul. It's good to be with you again. Now, based on the current figures, is it feasible that Australia could eliminate COVID-19 without a vaccine? And what needs to be done? Paul, I think it is now feasible that we could eradicate the virus from Australia. It's not an easy task because it will require the cooperation for quite a considerable period of time of all of the people of Australia. But we've managed to get the number of new cases in many of the states down to zero over several days. And if we can go about doing rigorous testing, contact tracing and getting people to comply with the various restrictions that were put on their movements and behaviour up till now, within two or three months, we could declare that we have no remaining cases of COVID-19 in Australia. That's uh, quite exciting to have reached that point. Now, in relation to, uh, I guess, this next phase then, as we're, we're sort of controlling the number of cases, this report that's been produced, Road to Recovery, can you explain controlled adaptation? And is it the same as suppression or reducing transmission? Effectively, yes. I mean, the adaptation is the idea of Australia living in a world where there's a lot of coronavirus outside of Australia and we're doing our very best to make sure that there's not a, a significant amount within Australia. Again, the requirement is very much the same. It requires people to follow the rules that are they're given for a, a, probably an indefinite period of time. But more importantly, lots of contact tracing, lots of testing to make sure that should there be a case or two in Australia, we can ring fence it and make sure it doesn't become more of an epidemic. Of course, for both of the two strategies in the report, it's also necessary effectively to close the borders, to stop people coming into Australia without being screened and quarantined for a lengthy period of time. What are the benefits of elimination compared to controlled adaptation? Eventually, it's almost the same thing, uh, but elimination would probably feel more normal because we could go about all of our activities of normal life in Australia the contact tracing and screening would have to still be there in the background in case we had a case or two that came in from outside. But for practical purposes, we would feel we were back to normal within Australia. The difference between now and uh, then would be significant. On the other hand, the difference between what it would then be like and what life was like before would be that we would be an island in a sea of coronavirus infections and that we would really have to see our borders as closed. In terms of these methods then, uh, do you agree with those uh, approaches and those descriptions? Is there, a, is there another um, method or, or um, do you favour either of them? Look, my, there are two challenges I see with either of the two proposals and, the, and with any other approach to some extent. But one is that both of them are in the long run dependent on us developing a vaccine. And if there is no vaccine, then there will be no reduction in the external burden of infection round about Australia. And there will always be the chance that the virus will come back in through some accident of people arriving from the wrong place at the wrong time. So that as a strategy to get everything back to normal, it does eventually depend on the development of an effective vaccine and its global delivery. And the development of a vaccine within the next year or so might be possible. But if you start thinking about global delivery of vaccines, then we're really not that good at it. We, we, we struggle to deliver the standard childhood vaccines across the whole planet uh, in an effective manner. And we keep having outbreaks of common infectious diseases like measles and also more serious ones like polio, despite all of the global effort to get universal vaccination. So universal vaccination is going to be really hard. The second thing, of course, is it actually depends on the compliance of everybody within Australia with the rules. It just takes one person to take a boat off from Australia to one of the near neighbour islands, come back with the virus and the campaign stops. And it, it's really quite hard to expect everybody to behave in a perfect manner over the course of a period of time. So we have to think about whether there really is another alternative and the only other alternative that makes sense is to allow the gradual spread of infection through the community in a way that doesn't overload the health system until we actually build up herd immunity. 
That, of course, means there, there will be more deaths than would be occurring through the, either of the other two possible approaches. It also is, to some extent, a risky one because we really don't know how well it, natural immunity after infection is going to last. And until we have those information, it's really very hard to decide with, between the three different alternatives. In the short term, I suspect that the, the, the basically uh, controlled adaption approach will be the one that we will choose to adopt because it allows people to go about their natural lives in a more effective way and accepts that there may be the occasional case occurred within the country. The big challenge with, with that will be for the impact on the economy given that it will not be easy pe for people to move in and out of the country and we do repent. We send a million people every year over, or every, every day I think it is overseas, something like that. Uh, some, it's a very important part of the Australian business life. Well, indeed, that controlled uh, adaption um, method is, seems to be what is now occurring with some states starting to uh, ease restrictions. Is that a sign that we're in some way uh, out of the woods? Uh, and, and or, you know, how should, how should the public, I guess, respond to the fact that restrictions are being eased? Look, I think we are in a very good position in Australia, unique almost across the world, that we have got to the stage that we've been through an epidemic, we've got rid of it, and through people behaving appropriately and testing and containment, we've managed to get the disease largely under control in Australia. And I think we will be able to maintain that. But it's still worrying that within the last couple of weeks, we've had two significant outbreaks in health healthcare facilities amongst particularly vulnerable populations that we didn't manage to prevent. And there will continue to be such outbreaks for sure, regardless of how we go about trying to control things. Can you give me any update now, uh, Ian, on the work being done on vaccines uh, from the University of Queensland and beyond? We're very fortunate that we have got great vaccine technologies available now that were simply not available 20, 30 years ago. And uh, within Australia, there are several vaccine programs under development, including one at the University of Queensland, based on what I would regard as one of the best possible techniques for making such a vaccine, because it's a, a, a protein-based vaccine using what I would regard as fairly standard and routine technologies for developing a vaccine. So that it, I would guess that would be one that would have a high chance of success if any vaccine is going to work. But worldwide, there are over 80 known uh, vaccines under development and using all of the available technologies. We have essentially five quite different technologies for developing vaccines now, and one or other of them, I'm sure, will give some sort of protection. Whether any, any of them will end up giving us lifelong protection against the infection is another matter because that depends on the nature of the immune response that will, control, will prevent the infection. But yes, the progress is good. Where the University of Queensland vaccine has demonstrated that can, it can neutralise the virus in animals, and that's probably the most important first step towards getting a vaccine into humans. It still doesn't shorten the process, a minimum of a year if we're going to demonstrate safety, efficacy, and then scale up for production to even start immunising the general public. Uh, while we're waiting for a viable vaccine, where do you see the most exciting research taking place at the moment? Look, it, it was very exciting to hear that the first, a first positive result from a drug study given to patients with the infection, which appears to have shortened the course of the disease, a drug called remdesivir, which is an antiviral agent which has been developed for Ebola virus, in fact, has been shown to be at least at some level effective. Not yet at the level that you could say, wow, we've got a potential treatment for this disease, but it does mean that there is a weakness in the virus that can be targeted and maybe with better drugs developed round Desivir as a model, we can get to the stage where we can get a drug which will be as good as the treatments we now have for controlling, for example, HIV infection, whereas 20 years ago we were struggling to find a single drug that would be useful. All right. Ian Fraser, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And if you have a question about COVID-19, just send us a message on social media or head to our website, science.org.au. I'm Paul Richards. See you soon.